The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Hello, this is John Grills from Creepy. Want to see something scary? <laughs> Shudder is the ultimate streaming service for fans of horror, thrillers, and the supernatural. Brought to you by AMC Networks. Shudder is a premium streaming service that promises its members a multi-sensory dive into fantastical worlds. All uncut and commercial free. Discover films and series that cover the entire horror spectrum, including highly anticipated new releases like The Boy Behind the Door, and one of my new favorite movies, Psycho Gorman. Available ad-free on demand and through the platforms you're already on shutter so good it's scary sign up at shutter.com that's s-h-u-d-d-e-r security checkpoints along the way so like our bus had to get checked as we went in and then when we went back to the village you went through security took your temperature had to hold your credentials up to a machine, basically verify it was you. The government decided it didn't want anything to happen to the Olympics. So there was a giant uh, meeting of students demonstrating, protesting, planning their next move. And the government sent in troops. They sent in tanks, they sent in helicopters, and they started firing on the protesters. This win in China ruffled some feathers um, on the nationalist side, you know, people saying that Taiwan shouldn't even be, you know, competing against China because Taiwan is a part of China. You could argue that like 1964, these are in fact the inclusion game because whether you agree or disagree with the Japanese government, the the games went ahead uh, in the face of significant risk. I'm Rohini Kurup and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 9th, 2021. The Olympics ended yesterday after more than two weeks of exciting international competition in Tokyo. We're mixing it up on today's episode of the podcast and taking a look back at some of the security and international affairs issues that you might have noticed in this year's games. First, I sat down with author Roy Tomizawa to talk about the last time that Japan hosted the Summer Olympics, in 1964, and the similarities with this year's games. Next, Bryce Clem talked with Libby Lang, former speechwriter for Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen, about the tense relations between China and Taiwan on display at the Olympics. Jacob Schultz then spoke to Ethan Shiner, a professor at UC Davis, about the history of violence at the Olympics. Finally, Bryce talked to Claire Collins, an Olympic rower and a member of the U.S. national team, about participating in this year's Games and some of the security challenges that followed. It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 9th. The Olympics aren't all fun and games. First up, we have Roy Tomizawa. So I wanted to start by turning to the past. Some of our listeners might know that this isn't the first time that Japan has hosted the Summer Olympics. It did so in 1964. You've written a book about those games and why they were so significant to Japan. Can you walk me through why they were so important for the country at that particular moment? Uh, the, The 1964 Tokyo Olympics were a pivotal moment in Japan's history because it came only 19 years after the end of World War II at which time the challenge was incredible. And certainly in 1945, no one imagined that uh, Japan could even think about hosting such an event. Everyone has seen pictures perhaps of Japan particularly bombed out Tokyo. 66 or 67 cities were, were bombed, especially towards the end of the war. Tokyo was devastated by 1,800 tons of napalm bombing on just one night of which nearly 100,000 people died. During the course of the war, 4% of the entire Japanese population had been killed. 500,000 of that group was were civilians. And of course, at the end of the war, after the, end, after the two atomic bombs and the emperor declared that the war was over and that people should endure the unendurable, uh, that began five years of basically the American and allies running the country for five years under a very strict austerity plan. And uh, 
those first five years were really tough. I mean, the Japanese people faced starvation, faced uh, disease, and of course there were no jobs available. So it was a really tough time. And if uh, if not for uh, the the Cold War and the the Korean War, which sparked uh, about two billion dollars worth of procurement orders from the American military to the to Japanese factories, the Japanese uh, economic miracle would never have started. So really hard to imagine. Just imagine Dresden, for example, trying to host the Olympics in in 1964. Many of the overseas visitors, of course, those are the only images they had of Japan. And when they arrived, they were very surprised at how modern the city was. Yeah, absolutely. And the games were were seen as very successful. Is that right? Yes, the, the the Tokyo Olympics were a huge success. By the time 1964, October rolled around, the entire nation was fairly well aligned. I think from government to corporations to students to, to every individual, uh, there was tremendous alignment about support for the Olympics. They knew they wanted to put on a great show for the overseas audience. Uh, There was a sense that we lost the war. Uh, A good part of the global population uh, has a negative understanding of Japan. And uh, they wanted to change that image. And uh, not only were the Tokyo Olympics a operationally smoothly run uh, games, there were so many people who said that the Japanese were uh, very friendly, very helpful, and very kind. And so the, the feedback on, on the games after they were completed were, were fantastic. And the Japanese felt energized. And in a way, they felt uh, that they were allowed re-entry into the global community. So in that sense, it was, a, it was a major accomplishment to go from pariah to even role model in, in a short period of time. Yeah, absolutely. How how did the games contribute to Japan's national identity after the war, and and what do you think their legacy was? I think the the most important thing about the feeling of the Japanese after the Tokyo Olympics was a feeling of confidence. It was growing uh, during the fifties with the rise of the economy. Uh, certainly before that, they were essentially run by another country until about 1951, I believe, uh, when, uh, when the uh, American government basically returned control of the government to the Japanese government and established a series of uh, security treaties. But there was this sense of, uh, per- I don't know, you could perhaps call it an inferiority complex. The Japanese have called it that. And over the 1950s and 60s, through the strength of their economy, uh, through the strengths of their creativity and innovation, they, they, they rebuilt the country. And so the 1964 Tokyo Olympics symbolized a, a rebirth of confidence in the nation. There was a, um, on the day before the end of the Olympics, October 23rd, 1964, uh, there was a series of sporting events that really brought the country together. Uh, one was the Japanese gymnastics teams. Men's gymnastics team was very strong and won gold in several events uh, in on the 22nd and 23rd. But on the 23rd, in the um, open division of the judo competition, the Japanese champion lost to the Dutch champion. So it was the only uh, judo medal that uh, Japan did not win the gold. It was uh, the, the only Japanese native sport. And so there was a bit of sadness in the country, despite the fact that everything had gone so well. But uh, just a few hours later, the Japanese women defeated the Soviet women in, in volleyball. And uh, that truly united the country. There was incredible viewership on TV. Five channels carried it. Basically, everyone was watching this singular event uh, when the Japanese defeated the Soviet Union three sets to nothing. And it was as if the entire nation exploded in cheers at the same time. So the games unified the country in a way that was unimaginable with the birth of television. And uh, I don't think there's ever been any event since that has united the country. Mm -hmm. 
You mentioned that the 1964 Olympics was a sign of a new post-war Japan sort of re-emerging on the world stage. What do you think the 2020-2021 Olympics represent? Is it a similar sort of symbol of recovery, as some have claimed, from the Fukushima disasters and economic stagnation? Or do you think it's something else entirely? I mean, I think there are similarities on the surface. Certainly, the operational excellence of, of both games are a common aspect to both. Certainly, people are saying how well the games are being run despite the tremendous challenges today. Uh, certainly, the resilience is a similarity between the two games. Japan overcoming uh, the devastation of World War II in 1964 to run the great games, and now, of course, overcoming the challenges of the pandemic to run these games is another similarity. To me, the perhaps the, the greatest similarity is in the word inclusion. The uh, modern Olympic movement was started by a, a person named, a Frenchman named Pierre de Coubertin, and the, his, his Olympic creed is fairly well known. He said the most important thing in the Olympic Games is not to win, but to take part, which is basically inclusion. And I, I'd say the 1964 Tokyo Olympics were the ultimate inclusion games. After the devastation of, and defeat of World War II, Japan's economy and global reputation were a shambles. Japan wanted to restore its economy, get its citizens back on its feet, and show the world they could be a peaceful, collaborative, and productive member of the world community. And so they were greatly hoping the world would accept them again. And they did. You know, you could say that Tokyo 2020 uh, Olympics are the ultimate exclusion games because, as you know, the majority of uh, Japanese citizens have regularly called for the cancellation or postponement of Tokyo 2020 in public opinion surveys in the first half of this year. Overseas spectators were told they could not come. Uh, more and more officials and support staff from overseas were told they could not come. And of course, then they said no spectators at all, which was a heavy disappointment to me since I had tickets here in Japan. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you could argue that like 1964, these are in fact the inclusion games, because whether you agree or disagree with the Japanese government, the games went ahead uh, in the face of significant risk. Right now, infection rates are at its highest levels ever. And so I would call these the inclusion games uh, with a very high degree of difficulty. Uh, organizing an Olympics and Paralympics during this pandemic is, I, I like to say it's like, like Simone Biles executing a Yurchenko double pike, which is a vault so difficult, no other female gymnast wants to do it. Biles, previous to this Olympics, could do it. And Japan is executing. So in 64, Japan hoped the world would include Japan, and they did. And in 2021, the world hoped Japan would include the world, and they did. You mentioned the, the public opinion polls, which show that people in Japan overwhelmingly opposed holding the games, in part due to the fear that it would lead to a coronavirus surge. You're in Tokyo right now. What has the public sentiment been like around the games? And has it changed at all since the start of the games? Yeah, it's it's like a split personality in, in Japan. Before the games, of course, uh, the news reports were all about uh, how the infection rates are climbing. And uh, there were, of course, people saying, you know, we should still cancel the games. And of course, you had protests in the streets. Now, actually, I was in the uh, one part on July 22nd, which is the day before uh, the opening day, I was walking around the Tokyo Bay arenas, there, there are a whole bunch of arenas for tennis, for gymnastics, for swimming, uh, in this landfilled part of Tokyo Bay. And I walked around that on July 22nd. And it was like a ghost town. I mean, it, that should have been filled with people, with sponsors having activities and events. Uh, it, it should have been a really festive affair, but it was there was no one on the streets. And of course, the arenas were empty. Now, the next day, literally 24 hours later, I'm walking around the area of the National Stadium and uh, it's noontime and everyone is looking up to the sky to watch the Blue Impulse, which is the aerial acrobat jet team that drew the Olympic rings during the 1964 Tokyo opening ceremonies. 
and they did the same thing the day of the opening ceremonies. And it was a very exciting moment, a lot of oohs and ahs and pictures taken. And then I walked around the National Stadium, and there were a lot of people taking pictures. And apparently during the opening ceremonies, a lot of people were sitting around the stadium and, and enjoying the vibe. Now, once the games have begun, if, we watch, if you watch the media on TV, there is, of course, the concern of the increasing infection rates. But the tone has also shifted to a very rah-rah attitude supporting Team Japan. Team Japan has done very well. They had set the record for number of gold records in 1964, has not been broken since until a few days ago. And I think Japan's at uh, 21 gold medals. So now the sporting world of Japan is very excited about the Olympics. But you see the, the somber mood in the news programs about the climbing infection rate. So it's quite a bifurcated look at the games. Great. We'll stop there. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm glad to help. Next, here's Libby Lang, former speechwriter for the president of Taiwan. So Libby, thank you so much for joining me. Let's jump right in. Some of our listeners have probably noticed while they've been watching the Olympics that there's a country called Chinese Taipei participating in the Olympics. What is Chinese Taipei? So Chinese Taipei is actually um, the name that Taiwan competes under in a lot of uh, international sporting events and actually in a lot of international organizations as well. So walk us through the origins of that term. I mean, how did they how did they come to be called Chinese Taipei? So prior to the 1970s, Taiwan had been competing under the name Republic of China because at the time the Taiwanese government um, was recognized as the one legal government of the Republic of China, which they claimed to also cover all of China. But then beginning in the 1970s, the Chinese government on China, the People's Republic of China, began to contest this. And so in 1976, Taiwan was denied official representation at the Olympics under that name. And so they chose to boycott those Olympics. So then in 1979, there was a sort of compromise reached between the two sides, between the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, the Republic of China. And the compromise reached was that Taiwan would compete under the name Chinese Taipei, which didn't fully satisfy either side, but was acceptable enough that they could move forward. So there's been some reporting about a difference in generational thinking when it comes to Chinese Taipei. I was wondering if you could you could break down for us, you know, what is the younger younger generation in Taiwan? How do they view competing under that name? So I think it's actually really important to understand first why um, older generations may have found it more acceptable. Um, And part of that comes from the two translations that you can take of the name Chinese Taipei when it's translated into Chinese. So for the People's Republic of China, for China, they translate it to basically equal Taipei comma China, as in Taipei, a province of China. Whereas on the Taiwanese side, they have it translated as Chinese Taipei, Chinese in the cultural sense. So Back in the day when the KMT was in power, when this resolution was reached, most of the population still did believe that the Republic of China government was the one legal government of China and that someday they would retake the rest of China. But obviously, beginning a decade or two ago, as the DPP, the current party in power, grew in popularity and people came to more identify with their Taiwanese identity, people have started to kind of chafe under the name Chinese Taipei because they think that it doesn't really represent the identity of both the country that they are from or the athletes that are competing under that. So this year, Taiwan won a gold medal in badminton. And I was wondering sort of how did this dichotomy that we're talking about manifest itself in something is which should be something as simple as just a medal ceremony. So the gold medal match took place between the Taiwanese athletes and Chinese athletes, and it was a very close match. In fact, uh, one of the last points, or possibly the last point scored, uh, was a line shot. And so there's sort of a snapshot of where where the final point fell, right on the line. And people in Taiwan quickly took that image and said that this should be the new national flag of Taiwan because it's a green picture. It has a white T looking shape on it. So people, of course, were very quick to turn that into a meme. But obviously, this win in China ruffled some feathers um, on the nationalist side, you know, people saying that Taiwan shouldn't even be, you know, competing against China because Taiwan is a part of China. 
I heard secondhand, so of course I'm unable to confirm, but I heard that um, live streams were actually cut off when Taiwan won. It's sort of a condensed version of the entire tension between Taiwan and China into sport, which is something that I think people are not so used to seeing. Yeah, I was wondering if you could dig in a little bit more on what the reaction was on on Chinese social media. I mean, this is something that, you know, Chinese social media is has become, I think, increasingly, increasingly filled with some nationalistic rhetoric. And I think that's something that you've written about for Lawfare, actually. So I was wondering if you could just talk about dig in a little bit more to their reaction. Yeah, I think one really representative example is a famous Taiwanese actress who's also very active in the Chinese acting scene, um, shared a post on Weibo, which is um, a Chinese social media platform, basically congratulating the Taiwanese athletes. And she used the Chinese term that would in English, translate into national athletes, essentially. And she immediately faced massive backlash on social media. She lost hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars um, in endorsements. And this took place, you know, within hours and days after she posted this. And so, of course, she then had to go back and share another post saying that I don't support Taiwanese independence, when all she did um, was try to fairly innocuously, it seems, congratulate the athletes from her home her home country of Taiwan. So I think uh, one of the athletes that actually won gold medal in, in badminton said while he was accepting the medal or in an interview shortly thereafter that he's a proud, he's a proud person from Taiwan. And that was unusual for, for Taiwanese athletes to do that on the international stage. Why is that? I think it's just always been avoided. There's a saying in Taiwan um, that sport is sport and politics are politics. Basically, that these these two arenas should not intersect. We should let the athletes compete free of these sort of political preconditions. But as across really all other arenas, China has been trying to shrink Taiwan's international space. I think that that sort of dichotomy is not as tenable anymore. And Uh, especially in the wake of the pandemic. And as everyone has seen in a relative sense, how well Taiwan has handled it, I think in general, there's just a much greater sense of national pride across Taiwan. And I think people are really much more willing and much prouder to identify with that identity of I am Taiwanese. And and that's something to be proud of on the international stage as well. So looking to the future a little bit, the 2022 Winter Olympics will be in Beijing. And I'm wondering, just based off of Taiwan's past experience competing in China, is there is there any sort of difference? Do Taiwanese citizens watch the games a little bit more closely or perhaps a little bit differently? I think there will definitely be uh, some trepidation going into that in terms of, you know, how Taiwan will be able to compete, um, what limitations might be placed on them. I think in general, the Winter Olympics in Taiwan are just a much more muted affair than the Summer Olympics. I think that's true in many countries. But I do think the fact that they will be held in China, people will be paying much closer attention. And I think that will lead to, you know, people picking apart every detail of the medal ceremonies and the opening ceremonies and really trying to find, you know, instances of either Taiwan making progress and doing really well, or China trying to sort of withhold that sort of national recognition from Taiwan. Great. Libby, thank you so much for joining me. It was a real pleasure to have you on. Thanks. It was great to be here. And now, here's Professor of Political Science, Ethan Shiner. The Olympics are fun, and they're often a cause for celebration, but sometimes they can also attract some serious security threats. So if you could just walk us through the history of violence at the Olympics, right? So I think certain listeners will be familiar with the two major recent examples, but but there is a longer history there too. You know, absolutely. And there, there are different ways of thinking about violence in the Olympics. And 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 the the foremost, I, I, I teach this stuff. I teach a class on politics and sports. And the thing that typically gets the students most interested is hearing about things like violence in the Olympics. But they, they come about in a lot of different ways. And so, yeah, I, as you were saying, uh, people tend to know about the Munich massacre, uh, which is the most overtly grotesque example of violence in the Olympics, which being 1972, 
when you had terrorists come in and take actual athletes hostage and ultimately led to uh, large numbers of people being killed. I mean, that that's what people tend to think of when they think of violence. And then as you uh, implied, they also uh, frequently think of the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, uh, where a person decided to set off a pipe bomb, uh, which was something that ultimately killed two people, uh, injured many. And that was a case really of a terrorist in that case, really trying to attract attention to his cause and really trying to uh, make the organizers uh, to, to really punish them. Um, but there have been other examples as well. And and so one of the ones, the, the one that has ultimately been uh, perhaps the most visual isn't uh, terrorists coming in, but was actually players. So this is the, the this is the real first case of really um, high profile violence in the Olympics beyond something obviously like boxing. Um, and this was uh, the blood in the water match in 1956. So in 1956, there, there was a revolution in Hungary. So this was communist Hungary, and people were trying to throw off uh, their, their communist yoke. And for about five minutes, it appeared to work until the Soviets came in and put a stop to the whole thing. Tanks, um, soldiers, the whole thing. And so this ended up playing out in the water in the 1956 Melbourne Olympics, where uh, the best water polo team in the world was Hungary's team. Hungary, for a variety of reasons, is incredible in water sports. And they had dominated the Soviet Union for years which uh, in, in water polo, which really frustrated the Soviets. But push ahead to the 56 Olympics, uh, the two teams, uh, Hungary and the Soviet Union, faced off against each other in the semifinal match. And this is right after the Soviets had come in and you know, put a stop to the revolution, had killed people in the Hungarians' home. And so in the semifinal match, it, this ended up being one of these things that, that pictures really caused it to attract so much more attention. In the semifinal match, a Soviet player punched the star Hungarian in the face. And there was a giant cut that formed right over the Hungarian player's eye. And so you had this huge amount of blood trickling down his face. And people love to call it the blood in the water match because some of the blood got in the water. And so people talk now about how the whole pool had turned pink. That, that didn't happen. But what did happen is uh, the, the crowd uh, started to go crazy, and eventually the refs called off the match, and police had to come in and help the Soviets get out of there without them being pummeled by the crowd. But this was a clear case of actual violence between players. Probably the case that people know the least about uh, in terms of uh, violence in the Olympics uh, was at Mexico City in 1968. And so the the Mexican government at the time was a pretty repressive regime, and they they were determined, the regime was determined to make this Olympics work. And so just about 10 days before the Olympics, there had been a, there'd been a series of protests for various reasons in Mexico City, and uh, the government decided it didn't want anything to happen to the Olympics. So there was a giant uh, meeting of students demonstrating, protesting, planning their next move. And the government sent in troops, they sent in tanks, they sent in helicopters, and they started firing on the protesters. And the, the numbers aren't clear, but somewhere between 40 and multiple hundreds of students were killed. About 1,500 people were arrested and, and countless more were injured. So those are probably the four big cases, one in 1956, one in 1968, one in 1972, and then the Atlanta Olympics in 1996 that people talk about with violence in the Olympics. And for, for both in the Munich case and in the Atlanta case, what is it, do you think, about the Olympics that makes it a particularly attractive target for someone looking to, you know, to, to do a real spectacular act of violence? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, it is such a high profile kind of thing. I mean, there, there was much less attention on the Olympics. I mean, just the, the television viewing wasn't as, as great, obviously, in 1956. But 1972, it was just the perfect venue for, for partly because of the television viewing, but also it made it possible 
to really highlight the fact that actual countries are involved. Um, so that, that was the case of 72, where what you've got is, in that case, you had terrorists from Palestine who were deeply upset about numerous things in the Middle East, uh, in part involving, of course, Israel. And so it was a chance to make the world focus on this particular issue involving actual countries or, or people from specific lands. Um, 1996, the, not so much the countryside of things, but of course, just the fact that so many people were going to be watching on television. Eric Rudolph, the terrorist involved there, really uh, ultimately was blaming the United States for various policies that he despised. And so he thought this would be a great way to put egg on the face of the government by attracting so much attention, again, through television. And when you look at the history of, of violence at the Olympics, does it seem... Is there a higher incidence of it than you would expect as compared to just normal sporting events, right? Like, so sporting events do have some frequency to attract violence, whether it be the initial bombing at the Bataclan, at the Stade de France, or different right. different things like that. Does it does it feel to you that the Olympics has been a particular site of bad things happening, or is it just law of averages? Yeah, I mean, I guess if, in fact, there haven't been that many Olympics, so it's sort of hard to know. And there are so many other events, um, so many other sporting events, uh, the the vast, you know, the, the overwhelming supermajority of which, you know, nothing happens. So it's tempting to say that more things happen in the Olympics because it's so much more high profile. In, in general, we don't see either of these things occurring that much. But I would figure that you would probably see it a little bit more in the Olympics. Yeah, because it's so much more high profile. And then you do have the the country angle, the fact that if you have some sort of beef with a country or set of countries, it can be much clearer in terms of expressing it in the Olympics. But I don't actually, I'm not sure that there are significantly higher incidents just because there have been relatively few examples. Give me a sense of what the security preparations are at the Olympics, right? There's so many different countries involved, people coming from all over the world, lots of different events. And on top of that, as you say, this real geopolitical, you know, tensions and, and, and angst. Talk to me a bit about what the security preparations might look like. Yeah, you know, this this is sort of a, this is an interesting one. If you go back, I, I, this is not something I have uh, looked at systematically. I haven't looked at multiple Olympics, but I, I, I've read a bunch about certain Olympics. So if you go back to uh, 1952 and 1956, I mean, there, there really were almost no security types of any, very few precautions. Um, people could really travel around as they wished. There was a great runner from Czechoslovakia, Emil Zadopak who uh, he was famous for basically just having conversations with random people all over the place because people were just coming in and wanting to meet him. And so he had a great time. He's just a big celebrity there because people just loved him. So it used to be really easy for people to get around. What was terrifying about 1972, um, the reason that ultimately we had the Munich Massacre I mean, actually, there's sort of a happy start of this story before turning to the, the tragedy. Germany, or in that case, West Germany, was trying to create a, basically, it was a public relations effort by West Germany to try and erase people's images of Germans from World War II. And so as a result, they actually put into place almost no security precautions. Um, this is actually, this became a real problem um, <laughs> when, you know, they, people came forward, you know, pe people who were studying potential problems in those Olympics and spoke to the organizers of the Olympics and said, hey, you know, here are 21 ways things could go horribly awry, including actually predicting the ways that the terrorists actually broke in there. And the Germans said, no, 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 we have to keep this very low security. We want to make it clear we are not a, a big country of guns and, you know, it's looking like the serious security forces from the 1936 Nazi Olympics. So obviously following 1972, the security has become much more intensified, but specifically what people are doing at this point, I'm not really sure. Ethan, there's so much else to talk about, but we are going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And finally, here's Olympic rower, Claire Collins. All right, Claire, thank you so much for joining me and congratulations on competing at your first Olympics. So our listeners up to this point have heard a lot about the geopolitics and history of the games, but I think that you can provide us with a 
firsthand account of what it's actually like to compete at the games in Tokyo. So my first question for you is, you've competed at the international level before. How are the Olympics different? Yes, I have. So I've I've competed at the Junior World Championships, the U23 World Championships, but this was my first senior national team experience and obviously first Olympic experience. And it's very different. I mean, obviously this year, especially with COVID was very different, but just in terms of the competition, uh, I'm a rower and people have been at this international level for years. So it's just a higher level of competition. There's a lot more distractions at the Olympics um, in a great way, but also, you know, in a, in a weird way, just so that takes a lot more to just hone in, put the horse blinders on and focus on the task at hand. But also there's moments, of course, to take a step back and enjoy it all. Yeah. So those are kind of the big things, the competition and just the kind of swarm of distractions that come from media or just the amount of people that are there having to interact with a bunch of people. So sure, that, that all makes a lot of sense. What was the last year of training like with so much uncertainty around the games? It was very different. We call it a quadrennial, right? So you have four years leading up to each Olympics and the last year leading to the Olympics is always more intense. So That was sort of the first thing that we've never had two Olympic years in a row in terms of training and all the emotions that go into it as well. So it was kind of hard to do it back to back. I also, I went home for five to six months in the middle of last year when everything shut down and would never have done that in an Olympic year. But obviously pluses and minuses, got to spend time with my family. And we spent a lot of time in different training environments, meaning um, we couldn't row together in boats. So lots of time in singles or by ourselves on the ergs, lots of, you know, obviously precautions and certain amount of people could be in bubbles or rooms together at a time. So there were just a lot of different pieces that we normally wouldn't have dealt with leading up to the games. So let's let's move back to the Tokyo Games for a second. I'm curious, what was your daily life like for the time that you were in Japan and what were the COVID protocols like? Yeah, so we, in terms of COVID protocols, we had a spit test every day. So you had to do that every morning. We had to get tested before we came into Japan. When we arrived at the airport, it took several hours um, before we were able to leave the airport to basically get... We had contact tracing apps on our phones that we had to download and set up. You had to, you know, do a self-health check-in every day on your phone. You had to carry your phone everywhere because that's, you know, that was your GPS. That was how the contact tracing worked. And then, you know, masks everywhere, tons of hand sanitizer everywhere. Yeah, daily life was, uh, you know, we were in the village. So in the Team USA house, we would keep on our normal schedule. So up pretty early to the dining hall for breakfast. And in the dining hall, they had, you know, plexiglass. It was awesome that you could still eat in there. I was afraid that we had to take out food. And so you still got a little bit of the Olympic experience, but, you know, plexiglass panels, I guess, um, in front of each of the spots to sit at lots of, you know, plastic gloves to get anything to eat. And then we would get on the bus to go to the venue, which was about 20 minutes from the village, actually one of the closer venues, which is a little surprising. But then, you know, practice or compete, still masked up. You couldn't, you could, the only time you couldn't have a mask on was when you were actually rowing on the water, but everything else around the boathouse, around warming up, anything obviously had a mask on. Your credentials you have everywhere you go gets you into. Um, each of the venues and back into the village. And the big thing was that I found interesting too, is there were all these security checkpoints along the way. So like our bus had to get checked as we went in. And then when we went back to the village, you went through security, took your temperature, had to hold your credentials up to a machine, basically verify it was you. And then, yeah, lots of rest and recovery. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of exploring or you know, getting to go to other events, but um, there was a nice lounge in the Team USA house, so we could watch and meet people there, stroll around. It was really hot, but 
yeah, that was pretty much a lot of the daily stuff. Yeah, so I want to move to uh, competition a little bit. Did did some of those protocols that you were talking about affect your racing experience or any of your, your practices? Not particularly. I mean, at that point, uh, luckily, we were pretty used to testing regularly, wearing masks regularly. So I think, I don't think it really affected um, the competition or any of our races. Obviously, it just sort of affected the whole Olympic experience that you would normally get in terms of just being more freely able to meet people, talk to people, um, see different things. So in some ways, maybe it helped um, keep everyone close and focused on their team. In that way, it was a little odd. So there's been uh, some reporting recently that a lot of athletes have said that competing at the international level is a lot different than it has been in the past due to social media. And some athletes have said they they delete social media because of any pressure that they may feel or view it as a distraction. And in your experience, I'm curious, do you find that a lot of athletes think about that social media dimension and how does it affect your competition? I think it really does. I, obviously, I'm I'm on the younger side, so it's at this level, I haven't seen the before and the after, but um, I didn't totally grow up with social media, so I can kind of understand the world before it, but yeah, it really does. So the big thing at this games that we were warned about was that there would be hacking in the term in terms of other countries trying to distract you. And honestly, at first when I read this email or got, you know, as part of thousands of email or a bunch of emails that we got, but so I didn't think much of it, but one of my teammates her Instagram actually did get hacked and it really did what they said it might do. She was pretty distressed about it because when it's hacked, it's not just that they, you know, delete everything, delete all the followers, you know, you don't have control over it, but they have access to your phone number. So she got kind of very threatening messages and, you know, they even found some of her friends and family and were sending things to them. So she just, and and it was distracting and emotionally, you know, kind of weighing as well. So that was a big piece that I think, again, like, that just doesn't, there's no option for that without social media, really. And then the other piece, we didn't do this, but it was kind of interesting. There were some teams um, that we raced against, like Canada, for example, that did their own social media blackouts. So they, once the racing started, they didn't interact with Instagram or social media so that they were able to not get distracted or caught up or focused on that. In hindsight, I feel like that's an awesome idea because, you know, yeah, it can it can kind of play with your head whether you're looking at other competition or whether, you know, random things that are happening. Like you just want to make sure that all at this highest of level uh, with everything at stake, like, you know, make sure that you're really tuned in and emotionally kind of in the right headspace. Um, and I think it really can mess with you. Luckily, well, I mean, I hope rowing gets to this this level one day, but obviously we're not as high profile as gymnastics or swimming even. And I can only imagine, you know, how difficult it is for some of those athletes to, like Simone Biles obviously was in the press a lot, but, you know, you can read as many comments as you want or not, but it's still out there and it's hard to kind of get rid of that swirling and swarming of comments and just things that are trying to get into your headspace. So yeah, I think it really does add another dimension because, you know, kind of by the time you get to the games, hopefully you're as fit as you could ever be. You're as strong as you could ever be. And it's really like who can put together the best mental headspace, um, you know, in the right moment. And it adds another dimension for that. Yeah, especially with all those um, distractions that you just mentioned. I'm just, I'm curious, has there been any follow-up with your, your teammate that was hacked? Has there been sort of any resolution to that? Um, yeah, so luckily we have these things I didn't know, but each team for the U.S. has a, I don't know, we call him a special agent, but I, he wouldn't really tell us exactly. I mean, we all have theories, but Anyway, we had our own special agent from the U.S. And, you know, he's, you know, digitally very knowledgeable. Apparently, he was very involved internationally in some international affairs. So he was a great 
person for her to have right away. So he helped, you know, we all changed our passwords to a lot of our things and accounts. That was the first thing. He kind of walked her through everything to do. And then she did end up getting the account back. But I mean, obviously it's scary, but it wasn't like real to me until I saw her at a meal right after it had happened. And like, she was crying, like it was visibly distressing. So but anyway, it all worked out. And again, she got the account back. Luckily, we had good people to help walk her through everything and keep her safe. But yeah, it's definitely definitely a threat out there. Yeah, wow, that's that's amazing. I mean, you think about how distracting that would be just in your regular life, let alone, you know, you're competing at the Olympics. So that's that sounds pretty pretty tough. My last question for you is obviously fans were not allowed to be at this Olympics. What did it mean to you and and for your for your teammates not to have fans or really even family present at the games? It was I tried not to think too much of it until and I didn't think it was that different until the racing actually happened. And then, and with, you know, we were actually competing and there were definitely a few moments where I was kind of like, darn it, I wish I could just go, you know, hug my parents after this race. Or, you know, it would have been so amazing to hear a great crowd at the end of the race and um, have that whole atmosphere and just have I mean, everything was alive. Like there definitely was a lot of amazing energy, both in the village and at the venue. So all of that piece of the atmosphere was there, but I can only imagine how much greater that would be having obviously fans and family walking around and, but, you know, outside the venue, they probably wouldn't be allowed at the village, but like around the venues, at the venues. So yeah, I mean, it gives me, I have a lot of drive to go for the next Olympics, but um, it, you know, I hope our world is in a better place at that point. And part of that drive too would be awesome to have my parents be able to come and watch. But yeah, it was definitely a little tough not having people there, but still awesome. Yeah, that's that sounds both tough and tough and awesome. Well, I can tell you we're all we're all rooting for you in the next Olympic cycle, and uh, just want to once again say congratulations on uh, competing at your first games and thank you so much for coming on thank you the lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the brookings institution the podcast is produced and edited by jen pacha howell ian enright and hamza situ of goat rodeo are our audio engineers our music is performed by sophia yan please rate and review the podcast and share us on twitter and facebook As always, thanks for listening. Hello, this is Hannah from Red Handed. Would you like to watch something scary? Like, really scary. So scary you'll hide behind the sofa. Then you need Shudder. Shudder is the ultimate streaming service. If you like heart-racing thrillers, the mind-bending supernatural, and a good old gut-wrenching horror, discover an unbeatable collection of Hollywood classics and critically acclaimed new genre films that are sure to leave you feeling satisfied, if a little freaked out. Sign up now at Shudder.com. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com. Shudder. So good, it's scary.